The best portrait of me ever was painted and then given to me by one of the nicest people I have ever known. My friend Fred Danziger is a nationally renowned artist who has had some 20 one-person shows at Katerina Rich Perloff Gallery and Sherry French Gallery in New York City, James Gallery in Pittsburgh, and Roger LaPelle Gallery and Fan Gallery in Philadelphia. He even won an Emmy for art he did for a documentary about Philadelphia history. Fred is also a major supporter of his fellow artists, and he has put together a show at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts of artworks that he has collected over the years. Fred and I both are proud Academy graduates who believe that the school put us on a pathway to our artistic lives. Fred developed magnificently as an artist and eventually the Academy came calling. In 1997, I joined the faculty of the Academy teaching portrait and still life classes. This gave me a new perspective and I did my best to provide my students with an Academy experience. I came to understand that simply by being artists, faculty members could both instruct and inspire. And students also learned a lot from one another. We all had this thing that we felt compelled to do, make art, of course. There's Fred the artist, Fred the teacher, but what about Fred the collector? It wasn't until 2009 that I began to seriously collect art. One of my art dealers was an Academy alum named Roger LaPelle. And to my delight, he began showing many of the people I had taught. I never forgot how my great teacher, Jimmy Luters, had come to my very first exhibit and had bought a small piece and what that meant to me. I decided it was time for me to do the same. With a very limited budget, I collected only small works, but I knew that even this would pay a bill or two for the artist and give them the message, someone cares. In 2020, during the pandemic lockdown, a sense of panic filled the art world as art galleries, art schools, and art museums all closed. At that point, I began to purchase something every week, usually by mail, directly from the artists I knew or whose work I followed on social media. By October, I had so much work, my walls were filled and I began to stack things in the corners of my studio. I was talking one day with Andrea Strang at Gallery 222 in Malvern. I need my own museum. Andrea, in an amazing gesture of support, offered me her gallery for two months to show the works of 101 artists, even though none of the works would be for sale. The attendance was limited by the pandemic, but we created strong online events and at least something was happening. I then began to approach other exhibition venues with the goal of having a large part of my collection more or less constantly on view somewhere. Almost immediately, other places showed interest. The spectacular Mainline Arts Center showed it for three months. Then the Southern Allegheny's Museum of Art and Loretto, PA showed it for another three. How did you persuade the Academy to host your show? In 2021, the Academy decided to issue an open call for new exhibits in the Alumni Gallery. I submitted the proposal for a show that wasn't about any particular style or aesthetic, but rather an exhibit about the Academy itself. I was very grateful when the jury decided to host Academy Generations concurrently with the 2022 Annual Student Exhibition perfect pairing in my mind. Can you give me some commentary about what viewers are going to see? 
The Alumni Gallery space is limited, and my collection includes 106 pieces by Academy artists. Working with C.J. Stahl and Kate McCammon, we decided on a salon-style hanging which would go up the walls, similar to the way students hang their work in the student show. We considered a chronological approach, but decided that there were themes and groupings which could tell the story in a more complete way. The large south wall, for example, features academy faculty that had been my teachers. The variety of styles their work shows illustrates the academy idea. They taught the foundations rooted in drawing and then encouraged us to take those skills in our own personal directions. The Julian Levy piece is a lithograph done for the WPA in the 1930s and is the oldest piece in the show. The Liz Osborne lithograph has a note in the margin to Jim with love. I think it was intended for Jimmy Luters, knowing what great friends they were. The large Ben Kamahira, loaned to this exhibit by Hilary Hawley, whose work hangs below it, is a painting that Titian or Velazquez would have appreciated. And I would wager that a hundred years from now, it will still be a work that inspires a kind of awe. Lou Sloan's landscape came to the collection via Jim Simmons. Lou often took students on extensive landscape painting trips. Jim, whose work hangs nearby, was one of those students and acquired that piece as a result. Jimmy Luters and Dan Miller were two of the greatest, most helpful teachers I had. They always seemed to be able to zero in on important aspects of art in their critiques. Also on this wall are pieces by my contemporaries at the school. Paul Kane, Tom Palmore, Mouse Myers, Carol Staub, who did the portrait of me in class as I posed working off scholarship hours, Tony DiRienzi, Paulette Bensignor, Betty Lawler, Lloyd Beatty, Felix Giordano, Cliff Lamoury, all were there during my time as a student. Also on the south wall, faculty members Joe Sweeney, Peter Payone, and Al Gurry. We also see really inventive work by Harvey Weinrich and one of the most poetic painters working today, Tom Sarantonio. Roger Lapel and Christine McGinnis on the far left were students a bit before my time, but they founded an iconic Philadelphia gallery and showed my work for over 40 years until 2018. The West Wall is divided into three sections. The left side is a series of urban images, mostly of Philadelphia. Jeff Filbert's Camden Rooftops was given to me in lieu of rent money in the 1980s when I owned a studio building in Camden. Stephanie Lieberman, Larry Francis, Taryn Day, Jennifer Baker, and Chris Nissen are all fellow artists I know quite well. Shoshana Rucker and Rick Butari show with me now at Fan Gallery. Ron Washington's spectacular large piece showing the influence of his PAFA teacher, Sidney Goodman, is a great example of an artist who paints lives being lived. Down the center is work by Elizabeth Wilson, Doug Farron, Diane Faisal, and Patrice Poor. They are all pieces which show the skill and commitment which I seek in the things I collect. On the right is a series of pieces in a variety of styles, but which all deal with nature as a mode of force. Lynn Campbell, Liz Heller, Fran Gallen's beautiful still life is another in lieu of rent painting from my Camden project of the 1980s. The Nocturnes by John Sevcik and Elise Phillips 
make an interesting contrast of styles using the same subject matter. The narrative piece in the top center by Adam Maroff calls forth his memories of living in Israel during a period of war. There's a kind of poetry in his work, as well as the pieces here by Dick Rank, Rosalind Bloom, Robert Bonet, and Rachel Constantine. The pieces by Janie Levy Polis and Jeremy McGurl each have their own unique connections to nature as a starting point. The small room lends itself to works which benefit from a quiet, more meditative view. Jack Gerber in the center was a great friend and president of the Fellowship Alumni Group for over 10 years while I served as treasurer. Joe Amaratico, another of my great teachers, is beside Clayton Anderson, another classmate. Clayton and I both were deeply influenced by Joe's metaphysical approach to painting. Jean Shaw was a classmate in the print department where Morris Blackburn taught, as was Ken Hamilton, who has become known as one of the very best miniature construction artists. Ken creates small, timeless worlds unlike anything else which must be seen in person to really comprehend. The North Wall is a kind of potpourri of styles and media. Each piece is a kind of conversation between audience and artist. Each has a unique voice, which ranges from a hint of the surreal to pop art to studied abstract realism. The Mason Raider and David Campbell Wilson were purchased from Lapel Gallery. Works here by Virginia Fleming, Terence Loragione, The Little Shell by Nathan Dernan, Joshua Schaefer's Pig, Social Commentary by Jimmy Ballou, Ryan Betley, and Mary Beth Chu, Prince by Martha Knox and Susan Roseman, and the abstracted realism of Joe Naokas, Barbara Jernberg, and A.V. Rankin are also shown together here. They each exhibit to me what Kandinsky articulated as the art of internal necessity. The East Wall includes a sculpture by Dick Rank loaned for this exhibit. His primitive style was influenced by his stay in Australia. To the right of the windows is a collection of representational styles ranging from quite highly rendered like Jenny Stubblefield's aerial landscape and Leslie Ross's still life. Works by Nancy B. Miller, Eliza Off, and Elaine Lyle are pieces by artists who showed in New York with me at Sherry French Gallery. The Lexi Thomas, Bob Waddington, Rebecca Miller, Nick D'Angelo, and Mike Manley were all purchased from Lapel Gallery shows, as was the Kathleen Hughes construction from the very early days of the gallery. The piece by Michael Kobuz was purchased from Cerulean Arts, one of the outstanding art spaces in Philadelphia today. The work of Charles Newman is an artist I've collected quite often. He's an extraordinary plein air artist who is a consistent prize winner in that very competitive area of exhibitions. Also on the east wall right, Rebecca Giles, who just graduating this year, Robert Heckman, and Nancy Ugranda. The left side of the window features many of my own students from PAFA. Sarah Hunter, Janine Leclerc, Reza Ganad, Misty Morrison, Sterling Shaw, Susie Shireson, and Athena Scott were all in my classes. The others were students during that time who I often saw around the school, such as Nicole Myluga, 
Teddy Yoon Stewart, Santiago Galias, Rob Stack, Donovan Entrican, and Colleen Hammond. The east wall left also includes a really great Bannister McKenzie interior. Julie Lauren Webb's amazing figurative piece has the perfect classical surface she learned from Harpafa connections and yet has a totally contemporary voice. It is a great example of the ability of strong realism to express a particular time and yet transcend the moment. The works by Heather Godlewski, Jenny Kanzler, Alyssa DeVille, and Michelle Leclerc have a great conceptual connection to childhood and imagination. There are many art couples in the show, including Roger and Christine, but also Lynn Campbell and John Sevcik, Liz Heller and Larry Francis, Mary Beth Chu and Ryan Betley, Sterling Shaw and Alyssa DeVille. Sometimes art school romances seem to work out. Well said, Fred. Nancy and I met in 1976 at the Academy and are still happily together 46 years later. Uh, sorry to interrupt, though. I also think the group of portraits here sum up what I see as the most critical thing about the Academy. Because it is a place where the foundational skills of drawing and representational painting are still an important part of the training, it allows talent and imagination to then find its own voice. I can't be more grateful to the Academy for providing me personally with the knowledge I gained there and now for hosting this show. The Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts is one of the great art museums and schools of the world. Fred, thanks so much for doing this. You are a credit to the art world and to our school. The Academy was very wise to award you a Crescent Traveling Scholarship back in the day. Nowadays, they call it PAFA or PAFA. But we just call it the Academy. Academy.